I still don't see where the speaker was that fell out of the wall, but uh, when something like that happens, we would say that that is an unfaithful speaker. It did not remain where we put it. Yeah. Sad to say, some of us don't always remain where God put us. In the illustration that I started our lesson with this morning in the on the notes, I took a look at the thermostat. The thermostat is a wonderful tool, wonderful servant, actually. We don't have servants today. It's really tough to come up with a parable that would help us to appreciate what Jesus is trying to describe when the master gets up in the morning and the water's already hot for his bath and his food is already cooked and everything's already taken care of and his faith, or he judges their faithfulness by how well they do that. And we really don't have that today. And so I think these inanimate objects really help us to appreciate because a thermostat does a lot of work for us. It means we don't have to go out into the woods and cut wood. It means that we don't have to bring wood in and light a fire. It means that we simply have to push a button and now they're all automatic. Used to be you had to get up in the morning and change it and then go to, when you went to bed you had to change it, but most people don't even have that kind of thermostat anymore. It controls everything. Some of them are so good that they will automatically turn. If it gets too warm, they'll put the air conditioner on and if it gets too cold, they'll put the heater on. And so they, they fulfill a wonderful purpose. And so do all the other things that are listed on the paper this morning. My alarm clock, my coffee maker, my car, my air conditioner, and on and on we could go. But the point is, we need reliability. My battery needs to be always ready to start the car. Because if it's not prepared to start the car, it's going to disrupt my day. And really, that's the point of the Lord. When the Lord sends me on a mission, you remember what God said to Saul? The Lord has sent you on a mission. You are my servant. Matter of fact, Saul was the servant on which God was going to pour out his vengeance on the Amalekites. While Saul failed miserably. The Lord sent him on a mission, wanting to show the Amalekites what the wrath of God looks like. And instead of doing exactly what God said, which was to leave nothing alive, it should have been something that was a judgment of God, just like the flood, just like Sodom and Gomorrah, just like the children of Israel were supposed to do with the seven nations of Canaan. And of course, they failed God as well. And so God needs reliable servants. When he takes the time to set things up, he needs someone who will do that for him. In this congregation, we have servants of God who can lead singing. We have servants of God who can preach, servants of God who can lead prayer and who can sing and who can offer and partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner. And God is looking down from heaven and he's watching to see our faithfulness. Now, this is one of the acts of faithfulness that most people won't see. What's going on in my heart? Is there true gratitude and true respect and true awe and reverence when we meditate on the Lord's Supper? Or do we just close our eyes? When we sing the songs, are we just making noise? Or do we truly make melody in our hearts and, and feel and mean what we say? So just like my alarm clock, if I've got an important appointment and the alarm clock doesn't go off, I'm getting a new alarm clock. And sometimes God has to do similar things. But when it comes to God, God has perfection. He is always faithful. He will never fail us, never forsake us, never leave us in the lurch. Never will we rely on him and depend on him. I think about David sometimes and I ask myself, do you think you could do that, Alan? You think you could go in front of this giant with just a slingshot and a couple of stones? You think you have that much trust in God? And sometimes I wonder, I really do. That would be something that I guess in, unless you were there standing there looking at it, you probably wouldn't know whether you could do it or not. But David had been well educated. He had already killed a lion with the help of God. He had already killed a bear with the help of God. 
And he said, what is this Philistine? So he did it by extension. Well, we should be able to do the same thing. We see what God did to the Red Sea. We see what God did with the various things throughout the way. And now he says, I need you to trust me. And I need you to unwaveringly do what I'm asking you to do. And so we have this verse right toward the middle of the page. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. Sounds like a song we sing. With my mouth will I make known your faithfulness to all generations. How about us? We make known his faithfulness to all generations or we, we are one of these generations. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. Do we fear him and respect him? And to be held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord, of, o, o Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. God wants us to understand in my perfection, in my wisdom, in my abilities and my power, you will never be faced in a situation where I could fail you. I will always be able, I've considered it all. We went through this in Romans chapter eight. I've considered it all. I know exactly every single thing that any one of you will ever have to face. I've got it all laid out. I've got it all figured out. And you can trust me. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And all things will work together for your good as long as you continue to love me. And the confidence that gives, the peace that gives, the joy that that gives to those who really believe that is immeasurable. Like Isaiah said, you will keep him in perfect peace whose heart is stayed on you because he trusts you. Well, that sums it up, whether we believe that this next situation that we're going through, God's going to get us through it safely or not, will determine whether we try to wrest it away from God and become an unfaithful servant because we think he can't do it, so I have to do it. This is what caused many of the apostasies. God couldn't do what they thought needed to be done with the means that he gave them, even though Peter said, whatever your hand finds to do. I'm sorry, that's, that's a, a different verse. Peter said, if anyone ministers with the strength that God supplies. I don't need any more. I don't need a missionary society or a sponsoring church. I don't need to make the gospel more palatable to a generation of people who are not interested in what God revealed and what God wanted. That's what a faithful servant will do. We can't compromise. I don't want my alarm clock to say, doesn't look like Alan got enough sleep today. I'm going to give him another 20 minutes. If I have to be up at seven o'clock and it puts me, it, it gives me another 20 minutes, I'm going to be late. And maybe it's the most important appointment of my life. And my alarm clock has messed it all up for me because my alarm clock felt sorry. Now I understand you could say, well, alarm clocks wouldn't do that. Well, of course they wouldn't. But we do. We feel sorry for people. We can't withdraw from this person because we need to give them more time and, and that might offend them and maybe they'll never come back. Well, wait a minute. Are you a servant of God doing God's will or are you a servant of God who assesses the commandments and makes modifications based on your own personal feelings? Well, that's what an alarm clock would do. That's what an alarm clock would do if it started thinking we need to give this man more time to sleep. We throw that alarm clock away. How do you think God feels about people who won't do the unpalatable or unenjoyable or unlikable commands that he has given? And yet we look at Jesus in the garden. That was the most unpalatable command, the most difficult command that anyone ever faced. What did he say? Not my will, but your will. And we really need to think about this, brethren, because we all have our little idiosyncrasies where we tend to not trust in the Lord with all our heart. And we need to look at those things because those are the things that are going to determine our faithfulness. As I've said so many times, if you leave home and you tell your children, I want you to eat ice cream all day. And if you love me and you're going to obey me, you're going to eat ice cream all day. Well, what does that tell me if they do that? But if I tell them today, we're going to have to work hard. You're going to be working from sunrise to sunset and you're going to be sweating and you're going to be tired. 
Now I'll know. It's the easy ones that tell God nothing. It's the hard ones. And so in 1 Peter 4, verse 19, let those who suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful creator. There's that term again. He will not ask us to do more than we can handle. Just like that passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he will never allow you to be tempted above what you're able to bear. Well, we too often think about that in the realm of our lusts and our sins of commission, but think about the sins of omission. Think about James chapter four, and verse 18, to him who know what to do good. Does God ask me to do things that are too hard for me to do? Never. And so God's faithfulness is reflected in the scriptures by promises, but then it's also reflected in the material creation, or at least the part of the material creation that doesn't have a free will. In Psalms 119, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. So is God's word faithful? Absolutely. It's forever settled. You don't have to worry about it. The words that I spoke will judge you in the last day. Not going to be any last minute changes. Not going to be any modifications. God is certainly not going to do what so many people are doing today when they think that because the culture has gotten so wicked, we're going to have to define down the, mon the morality of what God has revealed or we won't get anybody to come. God's not going to do that. He's just going to cast people away. Your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness endures to all generations. You establish the earth and it abides. They continue this day according to your ordinances for all are your servants. So the son is a servant of God. Remember that song we sing where we talk about let them praise Jehovah and we talk about a lot of inanimate objects. Well, here's one of the reasons why we do that. The other reason is the psalm itself. But the fact is, is that the stars are God's servants. And they do exactly what God has told them to do. And we know from science that you can tell exactly where a star will be a thousand years from now. Because they don't vary. And the sun puts out the same heat year after year. I've never seen a repairman jump up to the sun, get a ladder and fix it. It doesn't need to be fixed. It's absolute. It does what it's designed and planned to do. And so all are your servants. And God used this as the basis of all his promises and covenants in Jeremiah 33, where it says, thus says the Lord, if you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so there will not be day or not a night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. Now that's Jesus Christ. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers, that's all of us. We are now the Levites and the priests who are ministering to the Lord. And so the, this covenant that he's talking about is the one Noah had when he left the ark. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer and day and night shall not cease. God made a covenant. This is why when... People tell us about a nuclear winter and how we could bring about the extinction of the human race. I just shake my head and start laughing. That can't happen. You say, well, yeah, but scientifically it could happen. Well, maybe it could happen scientifically, but God won't let it happen. Because God made us a promise when we got out of the ark. And that promise was, as long as the earth is here, seed time and harvest, Cold and heat, winter and summer, day and night will not cease. And God uses that. He says, just like my covenant, go back up to Jeremiah one more time, just like my covenant with the night and with the day, so that there won't be a day and night in their season, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne. God did it. Now, these people were looking into the future where there was some doubt. There's no doubts anymore about all of the prophecies in the Old Testament, with the exception of one, the end of this age. That hasn't come yet, but it's surely coming. The second coming of Christ is coming. God is faithful in his promises. And just like that compass, you change your behavior based on the compass because the compass is telling you what direction to go. And if you're not going in the right direction, if you're smart, you'll make the correction. Well, that's what we're doing. 
God's word is forever settled in heaven. His faithfulness endures to all generations. He established the earth. It abides and all of the servants of God without free will have never failed him. They have always done exactly what he created them to do. No one can break that covenant. But it shouldn't come in any surprise that God expects the same thing from those of us with free will. He expects us to do what we say we're going to do, just like it's impossible for him to lie. And so, as I point out at the very bottom of the paper there, after promising that Jesus is Lord when we make the good confession, we enter into the new covenant. Now, I understand that there's a faith and repentance and confession and baptism, but it's the confession in which we, we agree to keep the covenant. The covenant is very simple. Jesus is Lord. Why do, why do you call me Lord if you're not going to do what I say? Anytime we don't do what Jesus said, we've sinned and we have to repent. And so after promising in our good confession... We entered into a new covenant. If we become unfaithful, and brethren, how many people have we seen that have done that? How many people have we seen who God has heard, I'll love you forever, I'll serve you forever, I will do everything that you ask me to do, and then in a moment of lust, a moment when the price is too high, oh, I didn't mean it. You can't count on me. Whatever plans you had for me, count me out. If my alarm clock would do that, if my battery in my car does that, if my thermostat or my hot water heater does that, I replace them and I throw them away. That's the point. When God, we're now on the top of the second page, when God was leaning and relying on Noah, Abraham, and Moses, what did they do? They proved their reliability. God needed Noah to build that ark. He needed Noah to build that ark perfectly. If Noah had done with the ark what Saul did with his mission to the Amalekites, God would have had to have stopped and either gotten Noah to do what he was supposed to do or what he might have had to do is what he did with the children of Israel. He had to wait 40 years. They were supposed to go into the promised land and start wreaking his vengeance on the seven nations of Canaan as soon as they left. But they weren't worthy. They weren't faithful. God said, I can't use you. Matter of fact, he swore in his wrath. You will never enter my rest. But more importantly than that, God had to wait. And I think sometimes about the prophecy that says the stone which the builders rejected became the head of the corner. God found a way. He didn't have the Jewish leadership. He didn't have the, quote, cream of the Jewish crop or the cream of the Jewish nation. He had 12 unlearned fishermen. Jesus had to spend three years training them and giving them the Holy Spirit but they did as good a job as anyone else could have done, and so did the offspring of those people who died in the wilderness. And so if Noah had not done according to all that God commanded him, he wouldn't have compromised, he would have waited. We read that there was 120 years while the ark was being prepared. God was long-suffering. He could have waited longer. Maybe he'd had to wait for Shem, Noah's youngest son, to grow up and Shem would do it. But my point is, God wouldn't compromise on what he needed. That ark had to be exactly like that, I believe, for two reasons. First of all, to show Noah how important it is to do everything the way God asked him to do. But secondly, and just as importantly, it might not have floated. Probably would have broken up. If he hadn't used gopher wood, if he hadn't pitched it, if he hadn't made it with the dimensions, we have to trust the Lord. He knows what he's doing. And then we come to Abraham. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham. This is in Nehemiah chapter 9, verses 7 and 8. You are the Lord God who chose Abraham and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you. 
He certainly was faithful. He was faithful when God said, leave your land. He was faithful when God made that promise and he never wavered. And he was faithful when God asked him to offer up his son. God did not find in Abraham what we see so often today. People who are willing to modify, set aside, lower, compromise God's commands and God's clear description of what we're supposed to be doing in order to make it fit. Abraham didn't do that. And then notice what it says. To give him the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Girgashites, to give it to his descendants, you have performed your words, for you are righteous. Now it's fascinating to me that even in the book of Hebrews, he goes back to that. He says, God wanted to show to the heirs of the promise. Now that's you and I, because in Galatians 3, 27, when we are baptized into Christ, then you are you Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. So we are heirs according to the promise. And as heirs of the promise, like Isaac, we are children of promise. Then he wants to show us, not Abraham, now remember, Abraham was a part of this, but to show more abundantly to the heirs of the promise, the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things, the promise and the oath, which it is possible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation. Now the question is, do we have it? The anchor that passes to the veil, when the strong tides lift and the cables strain. Will your anchor hold and firm remain? We sing it. When somebody dies, when somebody gets in a terrible accident, when the world goes through a coronavirus, when we may go into a depression, may, maybe the world is going to change, maybe we're going to have severe persecution, will our anchor hold? Well, it will if we trust God's faithfulness. God's faithfulness has never been the issue. It's always been ours. So like the battery in our car, these men always started and always did exactly what God wanted the moment that he said to do it. And that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. One of the most emotionally distressing things that we have to look back on because, you know, when I, when I lose an appliance, I just throw it away. I don't shed any tears over it. We didn't develop much of a relationship. But if it's my son or my wife, if it's someone that's a good friend in the Lord, that's a whole different matter. There is a lot more involved in great service to the Lord than just God getting the output that he wants. There's, a, there's another component here, a component that we'll de deal with a little bit more as we get into this. But look at what God says in Hosea chapter 6, verse 4, right in the middle of the second page. Oh, Ephraim, what shall I do to you? Now, Ephraim is the ten tribes. Oh, Judah, what shall I do to you? That's the two tribes. The whole nation of Israel, all 12 tribes, those under David, those under Jeroboam. What does he say here? Your faithfulness is like the morning cloud. And like the early dew goes away. Now, God has described how difficult it is for us. Let's apply that to him. As vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes, so is the lazy man to those who send him. So was... The Israelites sent to Canaan. So was Saul sent to the Amalekites. So was Nadab and Abihu when they were supposed to offer the fire God asked them, but they, they did not perform faithfully. Who hasn't felt that way when your car won't start in the pouring rain? Vinegar to the teeth and smoke to the eyes. Or when the alarm clock doesn't go off. When you've got an important. But like I say, I want to read the rest of this. Yet the pain and anguish of counting on a fellow human being to do something important for us is not limited to the loss that occurred because of the failure. The greater loss is when we realize that someone we thought we could count on 
is not loyal and is not truly the friend we thought they would be. And so Hosea 11, my people are bent on backsliding from me. They call on the Most High. None at all exalt him. How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I make you like Adma? How can I make you like Zeboam, two of the suburbs of Sodom and Gomorrah? My heart churns within me. My sympathy is stirred. If you plug that in to Jesus' statement, there is more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over the 99 who will have, not need, have no need of repentance. You get the thought here. You know, when we're baptized into Christ and we put on Christ and we enter into the new covenant, we don't simply become a servant. We become a son and a daughter. We become someone God loves. We become part of the seed of Abraham and he has made covenants with us. And he wants us to succeed. We're his children, far more highly prized than our physical possessions. We don't want to be to God anything like vinegar to the teeth or smoke to the eyes. Because as he says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38, now the just shall live by faith. If anyone draws back, if anyone refuses to be faithful, either because of lust or persecution, because of weariness or because of leaning on their own wisdom, and there's lots of reasons today, brethren, that the church is being modified, the doctrines are being uh, lowered or lessened, people are being allowed to do things that the scriptures condemn. And as Paul said, do not be deceived. A little leaven will leaven the whole lump. We can't allow unfaithfulness to come into the congregation and not do anything about it. If anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. Congregationally, Jesus said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. Congregationally, Jesus has said, if you don't repent, I'm going to remove your candlestick. I'm going to throw you away just like we do the alarm clock or the water heater or the air conditioner if it won't work anymore. But we are not of those who draw back to destruction but of those who believe to the saving of the soul. And I hope that everyone listening this morning, that, that's the way we feel. And this is burning in our hearts. This is exciting. This is an opportunity for us. Isaiah 41, But you, Israel, are my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen. The descendants of Abraham, the descendants of Abraham, my friend. You, whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and have called from its farthest regions and said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Brethren, that applies just as much to us who like Isaac are children of promise, not of the flesh, but those who have the faith of Abraham. The descendants of Abraham, my friend, that's me, that's you. We are all descendants of Abraham, my friend. You have taken us from the ends of the earth and called us from its farthest regions. That's what Jesus said in Acts chapter 1. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and unto the remotest or uttermost parts of the earth. You are my servant. I have chosen you and have not cast you away. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous hand. Now that's God's promise to those of us who enter into covenant relationship with him. But what's our response? Like all friendships, we're now at the, the very bottom of the page. Like all friendships, it is sacrifice and devotion that proves its depth and quality. Now, I, got, I have God giving his only begotten son. 
I have Jesus saying, greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Friendship with Jesus is based on the same sacrifices that he made. He set aside his will to do God's will and that's why he was the friend of God. And that's why he was my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. I want that too. But I can't have it if I'm not faithful. His, his commandments are not grievous. They're not burdensome. They're for our own good always. If we trust him with all our heart, we won't find a single command that we disagree with. Now, we may find some of his commands that we struggle to do. But if we repent and confess and get back going again, we're still faithful. Because that's his promise. Matter of fact, it's interesting what he says there in 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Well, if he's faithful and just to forgive us, I need to be faithful and just and confess. Can't just let it go. I've been unfaithful. I want my alarm clock to apologize to me if it doesn't get me up on time. Job's faithfulness. David's faithfulness. So now it's our turn. Last paragraph at the bottom. Now it's our turn. We can be as faithful and reliable as we choose to be. Not like the sun, not like the moon, not like the stars, not like the earth and the tides and the seasons, and the day and the night. Those are fixed. Absolutes. They don't have any free will. We have free will, but we should be as faithful as they are. Because that's, that's how much trust we have in God. So the next time one of our appliances fails, just take it the next step. Have I ever done that to God? Am I doing it to God right now? How many times have we done the same thing that they just did to us? And we're as irritated the life out of us if, we get, if we're rushing out, out the door and we try to start the car and the battery's unfaithful. Battery's unreliable. Battery won't start the car. And so, brethren, as we now open up our songbooks to number 268, are you faithful? I think everyone here is faithful because I can't see in your hearts. That's the problem. Sometimes we hollow out Trees will do that. They'll hollow out on the inside. And everything looks fine. And then all of a sudden it falls over and you go over there and you find out it's full of rot. It's been going on for years and years and years and years and nobody knew. We have to be sound through and through. And that's what this moment is for. This time when we get the opportunity to make ourselves sound again. Healthy, stable, strong. If anyone here needs to repent and would like to do so publicly, we'll give you that opportunity. If you need to be baptized, you can have that opportunity. If you need to go home and repent, you have that opportunity. If we can help you in any time, in, in any way right now, however, would you please come or come upstairs and let us know while we together stand and sing.